Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPTE podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today we've got a practice question related to the neuromuscular system. But before we get to that, just a quick reminder, if you haven't yet, be sure to leave us a five-star review. Be sure to like us, subscribe, share, whatever it is you do where you're listening to this podcast. We also have a YouTube version available. Just search for us over on YouTube. You'll be able to find all of our PT final exam content be able to follow along with the question if you like to read along and see it. Plus, be sure to check out all of the courses we've got over at ptfinalexam.com and you can get some sweet uh, tips, tricks, all of our cheat sheets at ptfinalexam.com slash podcast if you want to get hold, get your hands on all the stuff that we've got just for free over at ptfinalexam.com. All right, so today we've got a practice question related to the neuromuscular and nervous system. So as you recall, this system is the second largest on the exam, somewhere around 50 questions related to this. Again, this is all referencing the content outline that is valid up through 2023. Uh, we will be updating more as we get closer to 2024, certainly past October. We will be use, utilizing the 2024 content outline, which will have essentially the same content, but the the style and formatting of the questions will be somewhat different. You'll see some story-based or case-based questions, I should say. Really, it's a lot like a patient chart and you answer several questions related to it. They're not dependent on one another. So you'll just answer each question as, as if it were a standalone question, but you'll have a, a larger bank of information based on that patient. So in a sense, you'll get a patient case and you'll answer maybe three or four questions related to it before moving on to the next questions. And there will be a few of those, a certain proportion of those. Again, we'll talk about those when we get closer to 2024. But in any case, if you're listening to this down the road, uh, be assured that this is the same content and certainly there will be questions like this on the test. Uh, just there will be a smattering of these independent standalone questions as compared to some of the the case-based or story questions. So this system, uh, sec second largest on the exam, certainly one worth knowing about. Uh, we are going to go through a practice question as per our usual. I'll uh, give you a moment to respond to the question then we'll talk about the answer together. All right, a patient with an Asia A C7 complete spinal cord injury is being evaluated by a physical therapist for shoulder function. The patient reports significant right shoulder pain related to operating the manual wheelchair and the clinician observes poor muscle strength throughout the right shoulder musculature. Which of the following techniques will be most appropriate for the patient to utilize for independent pressure relief while sitting in the wheelchair? So again, we have a patient with an Asia level A, C7 complete spinal cord injury, evaluated by PT for shoulder function. The patient reports significant right shoulder pain related to operating the manual wheelchair, and the clinician observes poor muscle strength throughout the right shoulder musculature. Which of the following techniques will be most appropriate for the patient to utilize for independent pressure relief while sitting in the wheelchair? Option one, forward lean. Two, pneumatic control power recline. Three, push up or scapular depression. And four, manual tilt in space recline. So we've got one, forward lean. Two, pneumatic control power recline. Three, push up, scapular depression or four, manual tilt in space recline. All right, so this question revolves around, number one, do you understand what function is available to a person with a C7 complete spinal cord injury? And secondarily, how do you accommodate that right shoulder pain when you are performing those pressure relief exercises? And so the correct answer here is that number one, forward leaning. So forward or side leaning is an effective pressure relief strategy. Uh, this is performed by, as described, you can have the patient lean forward, just a, a full forward bend. This requires adequate uh, range of motion from the lumbar extensors as well as the, the hip extensors. So you, as you lean forward, you should be able to, to lean forward quite a ways, and that'll take the pressure off of the ischial tuberosities and transfer it onto the backs of the thighs. The other thing you can do is you can loop your arm around the side of the wheelchair and pull yourself sideways. So essentially, you are weight loading onto one butt cheek and then you're shifting and doing the other side. And so, by so doing, you can effectively pressure relief one side and then the other side sequentially by doing the side leaning. So forward leaning and side leaning, these are effective weight shifting procedures for someone who's in a wheelchair, especially, especially considering the shoulder dysfunction that's described in this patient where they have shoulder weakness because although it is, it is truly an effective uh, effective pressure relief 
technique by pressing up what's called a press up or a push up where you push down with your arms and you do you, by depressing the scapula you're able to lift your seat off the seat lift your butt off the seat and that's a again a good technique for low level cervical spine injuries however uh, it can be difficult, especially considering any any trouble with the shoulders. So we, if you have shoulder pain or weakness. And then the other thing can happen is that over time, you can develop overuse, overuse symptoms from frequent and we'll say very forceful pressure relief by doing the press up or the push up. And so while it is very effective and certainly would be the case, probably would be the the first thing you do, it's the, probably the most effective way to pressure relief. It is also extremely burdensome on the upper extremities, leading to potential for overuse injuries in the upper extremities as a result of the, the press up. And so therefore, one of the, the best alternatives you'll get is that forward lean or side leaning. Now these other options that are available, so certainly a pneumatic power recline or pneumatic control power recline, this would be for someone with a very high cervical spine injury that could not control their arms in, or have any upper extremity control in any way, they would require that power recline. So the pneumatic control, that's like a sip and puff, a sip and puff controller where you're using the respiratory system, sipping and puffing on essentially a straw in order to activate the pneumatic controls. The push-up, so these are the incorrect options. The pneumatic control, power recline, that would be effective for someone with an upper cervical spine injury with no upper extremity no upper extremity control at all, which would not be the case for someone with a C7 complete spinal cord injury. The push-up or the scapular depression or the press-up, that would be effective, certainly, but only in the absence of shoulder pain or any type of overuse injury. And then finally, the, the final incorrect answer option is a manual tilt in space recline. This requires a caregiver. There's a control mechanism on the wheelchair where they pull pull the levers, which permits the caregiver to recline the, the patient. Almost always we're talking about someone that's either a child or has significant cognitive, uh, or yeah, significant limitations in cognitive functioning so that it requires the attendance of a caregiver for all pressure relief. Now, while we're on the topic of pressure relief, just an interesting note. So the resource I used primarily for this question was Umfred's Neurological Rehabilitation. Uh, also recognizing that O'Sullivan's physical rehabilitation has a great section on this as well. Uh, the interesting thing is that they have some disparate, disparate guidelines when it comes to the amount and timing of pressure relief. So Umfred describes doing 60 seconds every 30 to 60 minutes and then physical rehabilitation. So O'Sullivan describes doing a two minute pressure relief every 15 minutes. And so as you would imagine, the, the O'Sullivan guideline, two minutes every 15 minutes, yeah, two minute pressure relief every 15 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> I guess you could just say that that is the most most encompassing guideline because it would certainly be, you know, two minutes every 15 minutes is is a great way to keep the integument intact so you don't develop pressure injuries. So if I were choosing a protocol, I would probably opt or skew towards two minutes every 15 minutes. Again, this is straight out of O'Sullivan. Recognizing that Umfred describes... 60 seconds or one minute every 30 to 60 minutes. And so again, practically speaking, that's probably more what patients will remember to do versus two minutes every 15. But that being said, as far as your pressure relief control, it, it would probably be advisable to do two minutes of pressure relief every 15 minutes. And then if they're supine or in some type of, of bed system, then they would want to have pressure offloading every two hours or repositioning every two hours. And that's often achieved by some type of either fluidized or pneumatic control in the bed. So for instance, I have a patient who has a, a thoracic level injury and he requires the use of a pneumatic bed and the pneumatic chambers essentially roll him over during the night. So it pushes him from one side to the other side. It's all on a timer and a pneumatic pump. Very convenient, especially for the long term so that he's able to reposition on a, on a very regular basis. Excellent, so there you go. The standard I would say would be for the lower cervical spine, you could do a press up or this push up scapular depression pressure relief. The only trouble with that is that it can overload the upper extremities and so therefore any, any hints of upper extremity weakness or overuse, you would then opt for the forward leaning or side leaning as effective strategies. And those would be good for mid to lower level cervical spine injuries. Certainly in, in uh, really anything from C5 and below, 
you would expect C4, C5 and below. Anything that you had any type of upper extremity control, you could do the, the forward leaning and the posterior, sorry, forward leaning or side leaning, especially for a C5 injury, that would be where you would be very effective at using the side leaning or forward leaning. Excellent. So with that, uh, we'll bring today to a conclusion. As always, be sure to check out all the other episodes we have here on the NPTE podcast. And if you haven't yet, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Be sure to leave us a five-star review. It really helps. We're trying to get the word out. So in the meantime, stay safe out there. Happy studying. Wilcrane fist pumps all around. And I'll catch you in the next episode. Thanks.